and welcome everybody that's on our live stream and um, hopefully we can have a good study about Gideon if you want to follow along with Gideon um, he's going to be in Judges chapter 6 through 8 so we'll be covering um, Judges chapter 6 7 and 8 and um, the way I've done my lesson is you, you you can almost just follow straight through with me as we go through the life of Gideon in the Bible here uh, I want to thank FH for, for doing the PowerPoint for me. Uh, I would have no idea how to do a PowerPoint, but FH and I met uh, a couple of days ago, and he, he was able to help me get uh, a PowerPoint together, and he'll be clicking through it for me so that I don't get mixed up and click the wrong slide. So if you like the PowerPoint, compliment FH. So <clears throat> let's get started. <clears throat> Gideon was a man of faith, and we'll find that out as we go through this lesson. But the Israelites, after the death of Joshua, Israel would become unfaithful to God, and God would punish them. The people of Israel would pray to God to forgive them, and he would send someone to deliver them out of their captive hands. And when they were captured by Mesopotamia for eight years, they called out to God, and he sent Othniel to deliver them. They had peace for 40 years, <clears throat> and then Othniel died, and the people once again turned away from God. Then God let them be captured by Moab for 18 years. They called out to God again, and he, he sent Ehud to deliver them. They had peace for 80 years after that. And Ehud died, and the people of Israel did evil in the sight of God again. It's just like a cycle. You know, as long as they had a judge over them, they would be doing good. As soon as the judge would die, for some reason they would start sinning again. So God let them be captured by Canaan this time. And they cried out to God again, and he sent Deborah to deliver them this time. Then they had peace for 40 years after that. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord again, so he let them be captured by Midian for seven years. That's just a background on the Israelites there. That's not necessarily, if you're saying, well, where did you get all of that out of Judges chapter 6? It's not in there. That's just a background on Israel. So now we're going to start in with Gideon, and you should be able to follow along starting in Judges uh, chapter 6. Uh, the Midianites would come and harass the Israelites so much that they had to go and hide in the mountains and live in dens and caves because the, uh, the Midianites would just come up and steal everything from them. But hiding in dens and caves was not that unusual during that time period. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, 5 through 6, it says, Now the Philistines assembled to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people like the sand <clears throat> which is on the seashore in abundance. And they came up and camped in Michmash east of Beth Haven. And when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait for the people were hard pressed, then the people hid themselves in caves, in thickets, in cliffs, in cellars, and in pits. Hebrews 11.38 also tells us they lived in caves and dens at that time. And even today, over in Saudi Arabia and Iraq and Afghanistan, there are so many caves over there, and people go there and they hide out in them. During the Desert Storm and, and the uh, Afghanistan War, whenever the Americans were over there, and they was looking for the Taliban and looking for the enemy soldiers, Sometimes they would go into these caves just to find them, but the caves, the cave systems over there is so big, they would have caves within caves, and they would have, they would have you know, trails leading off of one cave going to another cave. So if you knew where the cave was, if you knew where to hide, you could hide out in there, but it would be easy to get lost in a cave and then lose your life in that cave. But uh, they still live in caves over there. So it's not unusual to, to see that the Israelites would go and hide in these caves 
when the Midianites would come up and raid, raid them. <clears throat> In fact, if you remember, whenever we, when, we, when the United States captured Saddam Hussein during the Iraqi war over there, he was hiding in a pit. So, you know, it's not unusual for those people over there to want to hide in a pit or a cave. So the Israelites would be hiding in the caves to keep away from the, the uh, Midianites and the Amalekites. And the Midianites and the Amalekites would raid the Israelites and steal or destroy their produce, their crops, and their lands. And they also would steal all of their sheep and their ox and their donkeys. So this is another reason that they would go hide out in these caves. <clears throat> the Midianites would camp all around the children of Israel. And there were so many of them that whenever they would attack the Israelites, it was like swarms of locusts coming across the land because there was just innumerable amount of people that was attacking them. And the Israelites once again called out to God for help. And this time he sent a prophet to them. In Judges chapter 6 verses 7 through 10 it says, Now it came about when the sons of Israel cried to the Lord on account of Midian that the Lord sent a prophet to the sons of Israel. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, It was I who brought you up from Egypt and brought you out from the house of slavery. I delivered you from the hands of the Egyptians and from the hands of your oppressors and dispossessed them before you and gave you their land. And I said, I am the Lord, your God. You shall not <clears throat> fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. And then this is the important part, but you have not obeyed me. So it seemed like every time that God would, would save the, the children of Israel, as soon as that judge would die, then, then they would fall right back into their old ways and, and sin against God. Well, an angel of the Lord appears to Gideon and told him that the Lord is with him. And Gideon questions whether the Lord is really with them or not. Because in Judges 6.13 it says, Then Gideon said to him, O my Lord, and, it, and that's, not, that's not the Lord God Almighty there. That's just a respectful term that he was using to the angel because he didn't know that this was God speaking to him through the angel yet. He says, O my Lord, if the Lord, and this is God Almighty now, O my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the land of Midian. And the Lord tells Gideon that he will use him to save Israel. But Gideon immediately starts to make excuses why he should not be the one for the job. He says his clan is the weakest and that he is the youngest in the family. And the Lord tells him that he will be with him and that yes, he would be the one to defeat the Midianites. So who does this remind you of? If you remember back in Exodus chapter three, whenever Moses was at the burning bush, remember all the excuses that Moses gave to God because he didn't want to take on the job that God had him slated for to go to, to uh, Pharaoh and get the people to come out of Egypt. And Moses just kept making excuses after excuses. You know, I can't talk, I can't, I can't speak well, I can't do this, I can't do that. And then finally God says, yes, you're going to do it. And he did. And when he did, he did a good job too. So also in 1 Samuel chapter 9, when Samuel was telling Saul that he was going to be king, Saul says in verse 21, am I not a Benjamite? of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak to me in this way? So every time, it seems like a lot of times, not every time, but a lot of times when God would give jobs to people, they would immediately start coming up with excuses. And how often do we try to make excuses to God when we should just accept it and do what God asks of us? Gideon asked for a sign from the Lord to make sure he is really 
talking with the Lord, so he asks the angel to wait while he goes and prepares a meal for him <clears throat> to make sure he's really talking with the Lord. <clears throat> this was also common practice back then that when you had visitors to come to your house that you would prepare a meal for them. Remember in Genesis 18 verses 3 through 8 that Abraham did basically the same thing when the Lord appeared to him. And he went in and prepared a meal for the three men that was at his tent. So the angel says he will wait. So Gideon goes and prepares a goat and unleavened bread. He brings the meat in a basket and the broth in a separate pot. And the angel <clears throat> told him to put the meat and the bread on the rock and to pour out the broth. And the angel then stretched out his staff and touched the meat of the bread and fire came out of the rock and consumed the meal. <clears throat> the angel then departed from Gideon and Gideon knew he was talking to the angel of the Lord. But this scared Gideon and he was afraid because he had seen the Lord. And in uh, Judges 6 verses 22 and 23, we read when Gideon saw that he was the angel of the Lord, he said, Alas, O Lord God, for now I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said to him, Peace to you, do not fear, you shall not die. Gideon may have been thinking of the scripture in Exodus 33:20, where it says, But he said, You cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. So Gideon was afraid that because he had seen the face of God through the angel that he was going to be killed. <clears throat> well, Gideon is then told to go to his father's house and tear down the altar of Baal and the image that's next to it and build an altar to the Lord and offer a sacrifice. So Gideon takes some of the men to help him, but because he's afraid to do it during the daytime, he does it at night tears down the altar at night. Well, the men the next, in the city woke up the next day and saw that Baal had been torn down and there, that Baal's altar had been torn down. And they started investigating it and they found out that Gideon had done it. So then they go to Gideon's father, Joash, and tell him to give up his son to them for destroying the altar of Baal. They wanted to kill Gideon for tearing down the altar. And this is, this is pretty good reflection on Gideon's father. Joash, Gideon's father, says that if Baal was really a god, then he should be the one requesting Gideon to be turned over to them. Not just some man, but he said if, if Baal is really a god and he's really upset because his altar was torn down, how come Baal's not requesting that Gideon be turned over to him? So after Gideon, I guess we could look at that part about tearing down the, the altar of Baal and think about Elijah, though, at Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal that we read about in 1 Kings chapter 18. If you think about that, you got one man, Elijah, that's going to go up against 450 prophets of Baal. If you look around this auditorium right now, this auditorium, the way we've got it configured now with the sound room, will probably hold somewhere between 450 to 500 people if you was all sitting shoulder to shoulder. So if you can imagine 450 people in this auditorium and one person challenging them to a contest on their faith and their religion against your religion, believing in God, that's the way Elijah must have felt. It was, it was Elijah against the 450 prophets of Baal. And you remember that, that he, he told them, he said, you build an altar and call on Baal and I'll build an altar and I'll call on my God and whichever God answers with fire, then that'll be the true God. So he says, you go first. And he told the, pro the 450 prophets, y'all go first. So he stepped back and he let the 450 prophets build the altar, put their sacrifice on it. And they started calling on Baal to send fire down. Of 
course, Baal didn't answer. So they started dancing and hollering and screaming and, and, and getting rowdy. And, and you can imagine 450 of these prophets hollering and screaming for Baal to send fire down. And he never would send fire down. So the, finally, Elijah started mocking them and making fun of them. He said, maybe you need to yell a little louder. Maybe he's sleeping. You need to wake him up. Maybe he's on a trip. Maybe he's talking on the phone with somebody, you know. Maybe you just need to, to yell a little louder. So they ended up, they would cut themselves even, thinking that if they cut themselves and let blood come out, that Baal would come down and, and light the fire. Well, finally, the 450 prophets were finished, and Elijah said, okay, it's my turn now. He rebuilt the altar, put the wood around the altar, dug a trench around the altar, and put, put the uh, sacrifice on the altar, but then he does something very, very unusual. He calls for four giant barrels of water to come and be poured on the altar. So they bring four barrels of water and pour it on the, wa on the, on the wood and the altar. Then he says, bring four more barrels. So they go out and they bring four more barrels and pour it on there. And then he says, well, bring four more barrels. So in total, they bring 12 barrels of water and pour it on the wood in the trench and on the altar. And if you've ever tried to light wood while you're out camping somewhere, wet wood just doesn't light real good. And Elijah just couldn't flick his bick and hold it under the wood and get it to light because everybody knows wet wood is not going to burn. But then Elijah prayed to God and God sent down fire that, that, that consumed all the sacrifice, consumed the rocks licked up all the water that was there in the trenches and so elijah was able to defeat these 450 prophets of baal and that's kind of like like whenever these men were coming to gideon and saying you destroyed our our god but let's get back to gideon since that's who we're talking about tonight so gideon tore down the altar of baal and all the midianites and amalekites gathered together to get ready to raid the israelites now they had, the Midianites had 135,000 men in their army. And Gideon called, started calling his own nation to assist him and to stand beside him and fight. But he was only able to gather 32,000 men together to come and help. Now we have 32,000 men against 135,000 men. Not really, really good odds if you're looking at it in man's sight especially if you're going to go out and do a battle, 32,000 against 135,000. So Gideon is still a little bit unsure if, if God's really with him. So he asked God to send him a sign to reassure him. And Gideon asks God, he says, let this fleece be wet all over, but the ground around it be dry. And the next morning, the fleece is wet, and the ground is dry, just like Gideon asked for. And he, could, he rang out a whole bowl full of water out of that fleece. But Gideon is still a little bit unsure. So he asked God for another sign. And this time he asked for the fleece to be dry, but the ground to be wet. And the next morning the fleece is dry and the ground is wet. So Gideon finally accepts the fact that God will be with him this time. And now he's probably thinking in his mind, well, I've got 32,000 men. You know, with God's help, we can probably overcome the 135,000 men. But then God tells him, Gideon, you've got too many men. And he says, uh, I don't want these men to go into battle and win the battle that I'm going to give to you. And then they go home and say, how brave they were, how good they were, and that they defeated the Amalekites and the Midianites. He says, you got too many men. He says, I'll tell you what you do. He says, you let all the men in your army who were afraid to go back to their homes. So surely Gideon is probably thinking, well, I, these are all soldiers, you know, how many of these guys are gonna be afraid to go into battle? You know, we may lose 50, maybe a hundred, maybe 200. He says, that's okay. So he goes up and he tells his army of, of 32,000, if anybody's afraid, I want you to go home right now. 
22,000 soldiers left Gideon that day and went home. 22,000 out of his 32,000. Now what would Gideon be thinking? He's down to 10,000 men right now. Now he's got 10,000 men to fight an army of 135,000. The odds have just dropped a whole lot if you're thinking in man's terms. But Gideon still has faith in God. He still thinks, well, maybe my 10,000 men can defeat these 135,000. But then God tells him, Gideon, you still have too many men. Can you imagine Gideon's face just dropping like, Lord, we've only got 10,000 men here, you know? You got too many men. And he says, I'll tell you what you do. You take them down to the river and you let them drink. And whenever they drink, I'll tell you which ones you can keep and which ones you can't keep. So when they went down to the river, some of the men reached down and caught water in their hands and brought it up and drank water out of their hands. But a lot of the men would just get down, like you see on the PowerPoint here, get down and drink water straight out of the river. So God says, Gideon, the ones who have drinking water out of their hands, you can keep. Well, that was 300 men. 9,700 men drank water by laying down and drinking it right out of the river. So now Gideon has to tell those 9,700 men to leave and go home. So now he's down to 300 men. 300 men against 135,000 men. Not real good odds now. The odds are dropping fast for, if you're thinking in man's terms. But, but of course, God wasn't thinking in man's terms. So now he's got 300 men to fight 135,000. <clears> but he still did not turn back. He trusted God to be with him. And God told Gideon to attack that night. But he also knew Gideon was still afraid. So he told Gideon, he says, I want you to go down to the camp of the Midianites and take your servant with you and go down and listen to what these Midianites are talking about down there. So Gideon, goes, he takes his servant and he goes down to the camp and sneaks in and, and he gets close enough to some of the guards that are down there and he hears two guards talking to each other. And one guard tells the other guard, he said, I had a dream last night that a barley loaf came rolling into camp and knocked down all the tents here. And the other guard said, oh, he says, that can only mean one thing. That means that Gideon and, and his Lord, his God, is going to defeat us. And so here it is, a camp with 135,000 men in it, and they're already admitting that Gideon is going to defeat them. Well, they didn't know Gideon was there, so Gideon heard that. And when he heard that, he went back up more encouraged than ever now because he knew that God was with him. And this encouraged Gideon so that he had more faith that God was with him. So now Gideon divides his army. Remember, he's got 300 men. He divides them into three companies of 100 men each. Think of the faith that these men must have had in God and Gideon. They started out with 32,000 in the army and now you're down to 300 men and you know you're going to battle against 135,000. So Gideon had faith, but just think about the faith that these 300 men had. It's not like they had air support and artillery support to help them, you know, like we do now, but, but they were gonna be going into battle fighting sword to sword and face to face with these guys. So now it was time for Gideon to issue out the weapons. He called his 300 men and he said, okay guys, I want you to take this trumpet and take this, this uh, candle holder, this vase with a candle in it. Now, can you imagine these guys, you know, it's like, Gideon, where's our swords, you know? What are we gonna do with a candle and a, and a horn? And Gideon says, trust me, the Lord's with us. So he said, do what I do. So he, he sent, he sent the, the, the three companies all around the Midianites. So they were surrounded on three sides. 
They all had their candles. They all had their horns. And at midnight, Gideon blew his horn and cracked his vase so that the candle lit up. And immediately the other 300 men blew the horn, cracked their vase so that all the lights lit up. And they started hollering, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, all 300 of them. Now at night, at midnight, when it's pitch black out there, remember they're out in the desert here and it's, there's no cities with lights shining. It's pitch black dark and all of a sudden, here are these Midianites getting ready to do a guard change. The new guards coming on are probably sleepy because they just woke up. The old guards are sleepy because they're getting off and the rest of the camp is sleeping. And all of a sudden they hear horns blaring. They hear, they see lights all around them, surrounding them. They don't know how many men are behind those lights. Even if they had time to count them, they said, oh, there's only 300 of them. But they don't know if there's a thousand men behind each light or 10,000 men behind each light. And when, there, when 300 people are screaming and hollering the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, just think of the confusion that the Midianites were having. <clears throat> they, they started running around and killing each other because they didn't know what was going on. Probably the guards started running back to camp to see something, you know, to wake up the other people. The other people woke up and saw this guy running at them with a sword and they didn't recognize him. They thought, wow, we're being attacked, we're being attacked. So they started fighting right then and there. <clears throat> so it was just mass chaos. And, and you can imagine that, if, that at midnight, you wake up and hear that noise and, and see all those lights and you're wondering, how many men are out there actually coming after us? And then all of a sudden people are running through your camp with swords, swinging swords. So all the Midianites started actually fighting amongst themselves and killing each other off. And it made me think that it would kind of like be like kind of shouting fire in a theater or maybe yelling active shooter in a shopping mall. Look at the chaos that would cause, you know, if you was watching a movie and somebody hollered fire, fire, and the people jumped up and started running. But you've probably seen on TV at sporting events when people go crazy like that too. And they just trample each other and they kill each other by, by, by trying to get away. And so these guys, they just, they just was killing each other and, and, and fighting each other. And the Israelites didn't even have to attack. They just stayed out, out on the perimeter. <clears throat> so the, the Midianites finally took off running, the ones that were left, and they started fleeing with Gideon in pursuit. And Gideon sent for help from the men of Ephraim. He asked them to come down and, and help round up some of these Midianites. So they came down and, and helped him, and, and, but then they they got mad at, at Gideon because they, they wanted him to call them for the original fight. Judges 8, 1 through 3 tells us, Now the men of Ephraim said to him, Why have you done this to us by not calling us when you went to fight with the Midianites? And they reprimanded him sharply. So he said to them, What, ha what have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abazir? God has delivered into your hands the princes of Median, Oreb and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison with you? And then their anger toward him subsided when he said that. So how often can we calm an argument down if we would just be a little bit calmer and not get caught up in the moment? You know, Gideon could have said, hey guys I didn't need y'all I had God on my side you know we didn't need you but he didn't say that he complimented them and he and he calmed them down a little bit and they actually accepted his his talk so Gideon was was really smart by doing that too and then while Gideon was pursuing the Midianites he crosses over the river Jordan and he asked the men of, of Sukkoth for some bread for his men. And they refused to help him and actually start mocking Gideon. He says when he returns from the battle, he will come back and he'll whip them with thorns and briars from out in the desert. 
He then came to Penuel and asked them for food. And the men of Penuel refused to help and actually mocked him also. So Gideon said he would return after the battle and tear down their tower. And Gideon probably thought that these two cities especially would be willing to help him because in Genesis 32 and 33, they are mentioned. In Genesis 32, Jacob wrestles with God all night and in the morning the Lord touches his hip to make him limp. And Jacob called the city Penuel in Genesis 32, 30 through 31. And in Genesis 33, 17, it tells us that Jacob traveled to Sukkoth and built a house for himself and booths for his livestock. So Gideon must have really been disappointed when they mocked him and would not even help him with food and water for his men. But Gideon keeps on pursuing the Midianites and he catches up to them. Now there's only 15,000 Midianites left. Remember how many there was at first, 135,000. And, and only 15,000 was able to escape. But uh, Gideon catches up to him and he kills them all. And then he does return back to Penuel and Sukkoth and he does exactly what he said he was gonna do. He whips some of the, uh, the, the leaders of, of uh, Sukkoth with briars and thorns from the desert. And then he, uh, he goes back and tears down the tower of Penuel and kills some of the men there because they mocked him. <clears throat> After he returned home, the men of Israel wanted Gideon to rule over him. And in Judges 8, 23, it says, But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. And Gideon then asked for all the gold earrings to be given to him and makes an ephod and with it, <clears throat> makes an ephod with all the gold and he sets it up in the city. And in Judges 8, 27, we're told, Gideon made it into an ephod and placed it in his city, Ophrah. And all Israel played the harlot with it there so that it became a snare to Gideon and his household. Israel had peace for another 40 years after that while, while Gideon was still alive. But look at the faith that Gideon had to have to do everything that the Lord asked him to Gideon may have been a little hesitant at first. If you remember, he kept asking God for the, for the signs of the fleece. And he asked him twice, you know, to, to perform that miracle. So he was a little bit hesitant at first. But look at the faith that Gideon had to have. Even if God would have left him with the 32,000 men to go against the 135,000. But then he lost 22,000 in one day because they were afraid and they, they left. And he had 10,000 men. 10,000 against 135 is not good odds either. But then God said, you still have too many. So think of the faith that, that he had when God sent the other 9,700 home and 300 men stayed with Gideon. And think of the faith that the men had to have in Gideon and in God too. You know, if, if you was one of those 300 getting ready to go up against the, the 135,000, that didn't look like a real good odds there. But it turned out they didn't even have to fight in the initial battle. Now they did when they chased them down and caught the 15,000. But Gideon, once he accepted the job, once, once he realized that God was with him, he never looked back. He only looked forward. And he always trusted in God. And he put all his trust and faith in God. So remember what God tells us in Romans 8.31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? And in John 14, 15, it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And Romans 8, 28 tells us, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. 
I've got a quick poem I want to read to you. Actually, Thelma Massey gave me this poem, but the author is unknown. And it, it's, it's entitled, Am I a Christian? Would I be called a Christian if everybody knew my secret thoughts and feelings and everything I do? Or could they see the likeness of Christ in me each day? Or could they hear him speaking in, in every word I say? Would I be called a Christian if everyone could know that I am found in places where Jesus would not go? Or would they hear his echo in every song I sing? In eating, drinking, dressing, could they see Christ, my King? Would I be called a Christian if judged by what I read, by all my recreation and every thought and deed? Could I be counted Christ-like as I now work and pray, unselfish, kind, forgiving to others every day? Let's close, I think it's just about time. Let's close with a prayer. Our most gracious, loving, heavenly Father. Father, we're so thankful that you have given us your word that we can study it and read about men like Gideon who had faith in you and, and put all of his trust and faith in you and was able to conquer the Midianites. Father, we pray that we might be able to overcome our greatest fears just by trusting in you and by putting our faith in you. Father, help us to love one another. Help us to encourage one another and edify one another. Father, I just pray that, that we can reach out as brothers and sisters and help each other. Father, we pray that as we study your word, you'll open our heart, open our mind, so that we might be able to use your words to help us to live better every day. Father, we love you so much, and we thank you for, for Jesus. And, and it's through Jesus' name we pray. Amen.